Well, as I say, welcome back to this session, the first one of the New Society 1918 2022 23 session. And it gives me enormous pleasure to introduce Michael Bailey, not that he needs any introduction, because everybody knows who he is. Is that not right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And I first met Michael, I can't even begin to remember how many years ago, but he was he was diving or causing somebody else to dive for old, old steam engines, old locomotives that had sunk to the bottom of the sea on the way to America. Nova Scotia. And we've been friends ever since. And as you all know, he is the person to go to for anything you want to know about anything to do with railways and locomotives in particular. And he started doing this. He, in fact, has published a study on rocket a very, very long time ago, and it broke totally new ground because by, in fact, doing the archaeology of rocket, it meant, as I understand it, is that when you took it to pieces and took it, put it back together again, you actually could see the modifications that they've had to make. So you see, I've learned a lot from Michael. He's nodding here, so I'm getting it right. Anyway, I think it's a very wonderful way to start this session. And so I don't think I'm going to go on. I'm just going to hand over to Michael and off you go. I think you're OK there, do Okay, thanks, Dan. Hopefully, the system's working and everybody online can see the uh, the, the slides. Right, thank you very much. Okay, I was just mentioning uh, the involvement of uh, John Glitherow and Peter Davidson. Uh, I understand that they were hoping to tune in tonight. So, hi, John. Hello, Peter. If you're watching this on YouTube later, hi, John. Hello, Peter. Right. In the uh, Over all these years I was just referring to, we have undertaken between us nine different uh, studies, each of which has taken typically a year to uh, undertake and complete. Now I say nine, actually it's eight and a half because the ninth one uh, we, is underway now. Uh, Peter Davidson and I are currently undertaking a full uh, archaeological survey of locomotion number one, um, which is proving to be a fascinating study, one which has already revealed an awful lot more than uh, we have known about the locomotive uh, in recent years. So we're just at the stage of wrapping up the, uh, the, 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 the physical examination, tying in all the many, many loose ends of all the archival work, which is, uh, we've carried out. Uh, and uh, very shortly, with all the drawings that have to be prepared uh, and uh, all the, say, the loose ends to, to tie in, we should be eventually writing our report and submitting it to the National Railway Museum uh, next year. Now, last year, I gave a presentation with Peter uh, on the locomotive Invicta. Now, this clearly promoted a lot of interest amongst the society and uh, our guests, because uh, this, this, of course, was on Zoom because of the pandemic, uh, and no less than 178 people tuned in uh, to that talk. I was absolutely staggered at the level of interest. And during the course, or I should say after that uh, presentation, a number of members uh, asked uh, John Souter, would it be possible for Michael to give a talk about the rocket project, which of course, John and I had carried out some, would you believe, 23 years ago. So you could say it's a, it's an old report. Uh, it is, but it's been nice to perhaps speak to a number of, of members who didn't uh, have the opportunity of hearing the talk on the first occasion. Right, so, how do we start? Well, we go back to 1999. Uh, the Science Museum was uh, refurbishing one of its galleries and the rocket was in the way. It had to be farmed out. It so happened that uh, in 1998, uh, the Japanese had approached uh, the Science Museum. Could they borrow one of the prize exhibits? In other words, uh, rocket. Uh, and it actually went all the way to Japan and spent several months over there in that year. On its return in 1999, 
the gallery was still being refurbished. Uh, and so they had to find a, a, a temporary home for Rocket. And so it was sent to the National Railway Museum in York. And that was the opportunity that uh, the uh, NRM approached myself and uh, John and asked us if we would under undertake uh, a full archaeological study of the locomotive uh, uh, at that time in, in York. So what I'm going to do is very much what I did last year with the Invictus study, and that is just quickly run through what everybody knows about Rocket. It's just, I mean, it's so famous that I'm, I'm sure everyone has read a great deal about it. This is just to summarize that knowledge so that to, to help draw out the what it is that we discovered about it during our study. Uh, Rocket was, of course, made by the Robert Stevenson Company in 1829. Uh, this is the very first uh, published image of it that uh, we, we, we found. Uh, and so that was largely what people understood about Rocket at the time. Now, the, the locomotive didn't suddenly appear. Of course, it was one of a series of prototypes which had been promoted by Robert Stevenson himself. The locomotive components were being improved significantly uh, at that time. In fact, between the beginning of 1828 uh, and the opening of the Liverpool and Manchester Railway in 1830, a period of just 33 months, uh, the locomotive was taken from those, uh, the locomotion type of locomotive, the, the, the uh, slow and lumbering uh, engines drawing wagons of coal along the Stockton and Darlington line all the way through uh, to the planet locomotive on the Liverpool and Manchester. 33 months is an extraordinary short time. It really is one of the great stories of mechanical evolution uh, uh, that, uh, that, that we know of. The locomotive was, of course, getting ready for the Rainhill trials. It was specifically made to fulfill the requirements of the Rainhill trials. And therefore, it was lighter than some of the previous um, uh, uh, prototypes. Uh, but the development didn't, uh, uh, didn't stop there with Rocket. It, development carried on um, through the, the next series of months leading up to the opening of the Liverpool uh, and Manchester Railway. So um, this is the image that we all recognize uh, with Rocket. It's, it is, of course, a replica. It was um, so typical of one of the replicas made in 1929 uh, to celebrate the centenary. Uh, and it's one that uh, we have in our memories. Uh, this is what Rocket looked like at the time of the Rainhill trials. So in one sense, we were challenging uh, some of the assumptions uh, and presumptions that were made by the um, historians at that time in 1929, uh, E.A. Forward, J.G.H. Warren, and C.F. Dendy Marshall, who contributed so much to the, uh, to, to, to the design of the replica at that time. The Rainhill Trials, of course, I'm not going to spend any time on the Rainhill Trials, they're so well known that uh, and, and there's so much more to say, but this is a photograph taken in 2002, in October 2002, uh, on the occasion of the BBC Time Watch program, uh, in which we re reran the Rainhill trials using replica locomotives. So there's a replica there on the left of uh, Rocket, uh, the centre one of Saint Perrin, and the one on the right hand side is, of course, uh, Novelty. And this was taken during the during the filming, in which the BBC asked uh, me to be the judge and jury for, for the, for the uh, assessing uh, the, uh, the, the results of the rerun. Uh, and of course, Peter and John also uh, assisted in that uh, uh, task. It's worth mentioning at this point, something which we later learned, which uh, I, I don't think we fully understood uh, previously. And that is that Rocket, when it arrived at Liverpool to prepare for the Rainhill trials, it had lost its rear carry wheel set. Heaven only knows where it went. I don't know if it was dropped off the side of the ship or, or quite where, where it went. So they scratched around trying to find a replacement. The rear wheel set that was originally put on, the wheels were two foot six inches in diameter. 
So the replacement was an old wagon wheel set, which fitted, but it was actually two foot eight and a half inches in diameter. So the Rainhill trials were run with the engine ever so slightly tilted forwards. I don't know if it made any difference, but it's a, it's a point of detail that uh, I suddenly realized uh, during the course of the research. Now, the next event that uh, Rocket uh, participated in was of course the opening uh, of the Liverpool and Manchester on the September the 15th in 1830. Now it's worth bearing in mind that between the Rainhill trials and the opening, <clears throat> that uh, 11 month period, the progress that was made by Robert Stevenson and company uh, in locomotive design was just extraordinary. Um, most of the engines that uh, went on beyond uh, Rocket were so much better that Rocket, by this date, Rocket had become old technology. So very, very quickly. So it ran on the Liverpool and Manchester line for about four years. And during that time, it changed dramatically. This is a drawing that was prepared in the mid 1830s, about 1834, uh, showing Rocket as it was uh, four years after the opening of the line. And as you can see straight away, that there are significant changes that have been made. Now, this is not news. We, we've, we've understood all this over many years. But what we don't under, have not understood is why it changed so much, what they changed, uh, and in what sequence the changes were made. In 1836, just two years later, the locomotive was so old and so unfitting for mainline operation that it was sold secondhand uh, to the Earl of Carlisle and was dispatched up to uh, Cumberland uh, to operate on the Earl's lines running around the Naworth uh, colliery system. The main reason why it was selected is because, of course, the actual loading was so light uh, that uh, it could track, operate over uh, some very questionable track that uh, the Earl had on his colliery system. It operated up there for uh, about four years, and in 1840, uh, that was about it. It was not just not worth improving any further. And so it was tucked away in a shed, uh, out of sight, out of mind, and I think it was that occasion where all of the non-ferrous materials was removed. I, I never understood whether it was removed as a deliberate policy just to cash in on the value of the non-ferrous work or, or whether or not it uh, went down to uh, the lad down the road. One doesn't, one doesn't know. Now, in 1851, Robert Stevenson, who was aware that Rocket still was uh, still surviving, uh, suggested that it could be put on display in the Great Exhibition uh, together with a modern locomotive. So the before and the after, this is the progress we've made, that sort of message. Um, as it turns out, the Great Exhibition was so busy that uh, in, in fact, there wasn't room. So uh, in, in fact, Rocket never actually went to London. But in the interim, in readiness, to go there, it was sent to Newcastle from, from uh, Carlisle to Newcastle uh, so that it could be made ready by the Robert Stevenson Company. Um, and then it, it didn't go and it just got tucked away in a, in a, in a shed somewhere uh, and largely uh, forgotten. And there it stuck until, uh, of course, the, the great efforts um, of the uh, um, Sorry, I meant to move on to that's that's sort of the Paul Street where it was uh, tucked away. Great efforts of uh, Bennett Woodcroft and Francis Pettit Smith, uh, who were seeking the early uh, examples of machinery for the new Patent Office uh, Museum, which they were setting up at that time. And so it was negotiated with the the Thompson family, who had actually uh, taken over the ownership of the uh, locomotive. Uh, and uh, they agreed to make it available, but the Robert Stevenson factory actually decided to return it to its 
original, in quotes, original appearance. And when they sent it to uh, South Kensington, that's more or less what it looked like. And as you can see, it is, again, completely different, uh, even from that uh, uh, mid-1830s illustration that uh, we saw a bit earlier. So there are some significant changes. So our task was to take on the story from this point and try to understand component by component what has happened and why it has happened. So, as I say, we, John and I, started work on it in 1999 and spent the best part of uh, that year uh, carrying out the, the, uh, the study. We were asked by the National Railway Museum to wear white boiler suits, which we did because we were on display to the members of the public. So we, we duly uh, uh, concur with this. And there, there's a photograph of John and myself um, undertaking the work. You won't be surprised to hear that we were this, the work that we were carrying out was known as rocket science. We were measuring. We were photographing, we were understanding the materials of each component and seeking to understand the sequence of fitting component by component. So now I'm going to take you through component by component uh, what it is that uh, we, we learned. Starting with the boiler, that's the obvious and, and, and largest of the components. The boiler is three feet four inches in diameter and six feet long. And we were able to confirm that it is the original boiler dating from 1829. It's formed in two rings rather than the longitudinal plate form, uh, which some of the uh, most of the earlier locos uh, had been uh, constructed by. They are joined together in a butt and strap form. You see the upper segments and the lower segments with the strap uh, along the center line. Uh, which uh, was, was the method of construction, which is fairly new uh, at that time. Now, all the drawings that uh, we, we produced in the, our report, and which I'm showing you this evening, all the drawings were prepared by John. He was a dab hand at uh, CAD um, work and uh, has produced some absolutely splendid drawings, which go so far towards a better understanding of all the work that uh, uh, we, were, we were carrying out. Now, there's an awful lot of holes on a lot of the components. And it was our task to identify hole by hole why that hole was there. What was its purpose? Some of the holes were plugged, so we had to unearth them, if you like, to understand exactly uh, why they were there. Not always easy. Some of them were straightforward, but not always easy. Uh, but it went a long way towards understanding uh, what was fitted to the, uh, the boiler. In a sense, if a hole is there, it costs money to drill that hole, and therefore there must have been a specific purpose for it. We were able to see inside by looking through the uh, inspection hatch, uh, and this was very revealing to have a look in, inside the, the, the boiler of, uh, of rocket. The stays were, of course, interesting. There's no tubes. The tubes are long gone, uh, but the stays was, uh, remain. Uh, there are four different forms of stays dating from different periods of which Robert Stevenson inserted them uh, and in which uh, later maintenance uh, replaced them. And uh, we could follow the progress of the, of the, the, the uh, story of the stays uh, over time just by examining the different types. This, of course, was to stop the ballooning out of the end plates uh, because under pressure, the, the plates are those are the weakest point which I was trying to balloon out. The rain hill requirements, as listed in the uh, in, in stipulations, was that the boiler should be tested to 150 pounds per square inch. Now, not to operate, this is just a test to make sure that it was safe. Robert Stevenson had big doubts about this. He was very worried. So in Newcastle, he started off building to 70 PSI and put in the first set of uh, stays. 
Then he took it up to 120 PSI, uh, and he was very nervous. He wanted to stop there. He thought it was unnecessary to go beyond 120 PSI, but he did on one occasion take it up to 150. Thankfully, all was well. So that's the story of the boiler. Next, we come to the frame. Now, John's isometric drawing is, uh, says an awful lot. The basic frame is just a four inch by one inch wrought iron uh, form with that step down at the back. The boiler barrel was supported by the uh, boiler brackets, which you can see there, uh, and the bottom of the firebox rested on the lower step down there. The number of holes, I think you can even see by looking at that drawing, uh, how many holes there are on both the longitudinal members at the front and also the, the members at the back. It's riddled, it looks like woodworm, it's riddled with holes, but each one was a clue as to what had happened. The firebox, let's turn to the firebox. Now, the firebox famously was made of copper, copper plate. Now, the problem with copper plate is nobody made it. This was an entirely new requirement. Copper sheet, yes. Copper sheets were used for the brewing industry uh, and famously, of course, for the uh, for lining the bottom of ships. And Liverpool was a great uh, place for uh, copper bottoming ships. And so it was to Liverpool coppersmiths that the Stevensons turned and asked them if they could uh, increase the thickness of copper sheets to copper plate. In fact, they asked for it to be taken up to three eighths of an inch, just possibly a quarter of an inch, but three eighths it seems the most likely uh, thick copper plate by taking sheets and, and, and forging them to, to, together. And then to form a, a jacket in the form of a saddle. In other words, the crown and two sides that you can see there uh, in the various um, uh, alignments. Now this was done by hand forging over a former. So it was all very new and very imprecise as it turns out. When the firebox arrived, it was taken up to Newcastle to, to fit on the loco. When it arrived, um, Robert Stevenson made a note in one of his letters to say it was not quite square built. Okay, what did he mean by that? Well, the, all those holes that we were just looking at on that lower step revealed exactly what he meant. You can see here the very precise drawing that uh, John's provided where the the, the symmetry of the firebox is just not perfect. The leading, the front right top corner is leaning out by half an inch, and at the right bottom corner is leaning out an inch and a half. So it's actually quite a bit out. Hence, they had to jiggle it around a bit to fit it on that very precise framework that had been that, that the men had uh, uh, had provided. So that was the form of the very first firebox, made necessary, of course, because the boiler barrel had the copper tubes in it. And therefore, for the very first time, you had to have an external um, firebox rather than have an internal fire grate. Now, one thing that has to be said about rocket is that it was accident prone. Things kept happening to it. The very first one, obviously, was on the uh, September the 15th, the opening day, when poor William Huskisson was, uh, was knocked down uh, by rocket and sadly later died that day. That was the first accident. But after the opening of the line, all of the later locomotives took the responsibility of the opening uh, the, 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 the first trains of the opening days and weeks, leaving rocket to be used as a works engine. Because there were, in, in, though the railway was open on that day, uh, there was an awful lot of the line yet to be completed. There's nothing new in this. I mean, you look at any civil engineering project now, 
today, you'll still see that. Once you've decided on an opening day, there's always things which you uh, are left to do. Now, it so happens that the Shat Moss embankment still required further tipping of uh, material to stabilize it. And so one of the duties that Rocket had was to operate uh, trains of material uh, from Manchester along to Shat Moss, which it did after, after the operating day. In other words, after, once the passenger trains had finished, then it would set off in the dark uh, with the trains of material for tipping to, to one side with teams of men to uh, 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 distribute this material where it was required. Now, that's fine when you get there, you tip, and then you've got a train of empty wagons and you've got to move them. Now, you, there was no means of running the loco round and hauling it back. Uh, in, indeed, the locomotive didn't have a, a front drawbar. So you had to propel a train of empty wagons back. Never an easy thing to do, certainly not at that time. Now, it so happens that on this particular evening, this we're talking about the 28th of October, so it's only six weeks after the opening. And uh, the driver re received a, a notice from uh, a chap who came up to see him. Henry Hunter was his name. And he said uh, words to the effect, boy driver, can I come up and have a ride? Was he the world's first railway enthusiast? And Henry Hunter was beckoned onto the tender and he sat on the tender uh, for a ride on this trip. On the way back, the axle of the tender broke, causing catastrophe, because not only did the tender uh, descend into pieces, uh, but the locomotive ran into those pieces and was turned over. The driver was badly injured, very sadly, uh, and according to the newspaper report, uh, Henry Hunter was found to be quite dead. Very sad. Now, I actually like accidents and I like things going wrong because they are recorded in one form or another in newspapers. So I'm not being insensitive when I say I like accidents. It is in fact because a record is made, either a newspaper record or a coroner's report or what have you. They are always extremely useful. If nothing happens, there's no report and you don't learn anything. So from what we learned, uh, there was quite a lot of damage. And this was the first occasion when Rocket had to be taken back to the workshop in Edge Hill in, um, uh, in Liverpool uh, and the components repaired. But the important thing is that this was the opportunity for taking changes, making changes to Rocket taking advantage of some of the things that have been learned on the later locos and retrofitting them uh, onto uh, rocket. So this is the important message, is that retrofitting. Now, I can't point, I haven't got any sort of uh, pointer and the, the people on the Zoom won't be able to see this anyway. So we'll start with the left-hand uh, image. This is how it, the rocket was made, or the, how the firebox was assembled. Uh, from the very beginning uh, until this accident. You can see there in cross-section the, uh, the, the, the water-jacketed um, crown of the firebox. Obviously, you can't see it in the, in the side view. Um, and incidentally, that we learned that precise form, which was different from that which had been interpreted in 1929, uh, we realized that for reasons of the uh, the, 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 um, um, the, the bracketing, um, exactly how this was achieved. There was the internal uh, 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 component of the firebox was flat and the external one was formed into that, um, uh, the water jacket. Whereas in 1929, it had been assumed that both the ins in inner plate and the outer plate had both been formed with half the water jacket. So this was a, a, quite a change, which fitted in, as I say, with the, um, um, uh, with, with the fittings on the, what what's remains of the locomotive. What he did therefore was they had problems with priming. 
Now, priming was a major problem on early locomotives, uh, and uh, they had a lot to learn about how to prevent priming. So what they did was, first of all, to improve the circulation of the water. In the left-hand view, as it was originally, you've got the two pipes feeding from the boiler backplate into the top of the crown of the firebox, uh, which was okay up to a point, but it meant that uh, water, it was very difficult for the water to circulate. Uh, and in addition, of course, you must watch very carefully that the crown is not exposed when obviously uh, descending uh, down an incline. So what they did uh, is on, on this occasion in uh, November of uh, 1830, they reformed the firebox by first of all putting on a back plate instead of the dry single wrought iron plate at the back, they put on a water jacketed uh, firebox back. But this was made not of copper, it was made of wrought iron. Uh, so they put it on and um, they linked the firebox crown with that back plate. You can see the pipe illustrated there on that right hand view. They also put in a pipe underneath the boiler, feeding into the bottom of this new uh, uh, water jacketed uh, back plate. And to do that, they had to raise up the level of the uh, fire grate. So that was all undertaken, as I say, after this accident in uh, November 1830. Now, the, um, the well, I'll come on to the, the purpose for all this shortly. There is the surviving um, firebox backplate made of wrought iron, because, of course, the main saddle was made of copper. And that, as I say, was removed uh, all those years ago. And the firebox back is, is still very much very, very present. So let's have a look at John's uh, image of the firebox itself uh, as we now see it, or as we would see it if the saddle was, was, was there. So you can see the front of the firebox uh, was a wrought iron uh, plate dropped down beneath the uh, tube level. Then you had the saddle. Then you had the uh, new uh, back plate uh, in, the, in that form with the, with the grate uh, now uh, uh, raised up. So looking at it now, there's two photographs there side by side, one for the left and one for the right of that front plate, uh, which we just saw in the, in, in the drawing. Now, why do they go to such trouble? Well, it's all to do with the level of water. Because of all the priming problem, they decided that they would need to raise the water level within the boiler, which confined the steam space even further. So to overcome this, they decided to insert an extension to the boiler above the barrel. In other words, a steam riser. And from that steam riser, they would run a steam pipe, run it all the way back to the regulator valve. By so doing, this allowed the water level in the boiler to be raised by about three inches. And we've, this is a, as a result of a lot of checking from the evidence, which is the uh, holes in the side of the boiler for the, um, for the tricox and also for the um, uh, for the gauge glasses as well. They, they carried both tripox and gauge glasses. And there are two distinct patterns showing that there were two distinct um, uh, periods uh, of, of use. Now within the riser, sorry, within the dome is the, is the riser. And this, the dome, in other, in other words, was fitted uh, in this period of uh, reconstruction of the of the engine. So that's the introduction of the dome, which rather changed things so far as our understanding of what rocket looked like in 1829 at the time of Rainhill. The previous replicas portrayed the, re the, the dome as being on there right from, from, from day one, and it wasn't. Uh, and as I say, underneath the, well, from the riser pipe, uh, the steam pipe was taken down 
uh, and taken back to the uh, back plate for, for uh, uh, linking with the regulator valve. Also, this I've also included in that view the safety valve. Now, when the rocket was first made, the safety valve was weighted, and that was quite the normal way of, uh, of having a, a safety valve at that time until this time. Uh, but it, it, it was always a problem because if you've ever been on the replica of rockets uh, when it's been going along, perhaps at, uh, at, at the National Railway Museum, you will hear the safety valve with the vibration of the loco on the track. Um, and therefore, they were losing a lot of steam by so doing. And so they decided to abandon that and put in a, a um, spring balance safety valve. They'd actually done that on some of the previous locomotives. So rocket was retrofitted with, uh, with that. Now, I mentioned uh, about these holes. This is the evidence here. They're the tricot holes on the right-hand side. Uh, and by, by just removing the top patina of the uh, boiler barrel on the left-hand side, you can just make out where the sight glass had been fitted. Um, that's the top part, and the lower half is, is beneath the uh, photograph there. So that was the evidence that we used uh, to understand about the alterations to the, to the water level. So, rocket was returned to service in December of 1830. Now this is a painting which we didn't have available at the time of the study. This is completely new. It is a contemporary painting of the Liverpool Road terminus in Manchester. And the train going across is with first class carriages. The locomotive <clears throat> has a sloping uh, aspect for the cylinders. It is in fact rocket. The, the painter had managed to capture unwittingly a picture of rocket after its reformation uh, of, of, of the previous month. So it's an extraordinary thing, but there is rocket on a train captured by this artist uh, running over the, the River Irwell uh, on its way, because having made those changes, clearly it was felt to be sufficiently improved to be able to join the main locomotive fleet and take its part in, in the operation uh, of, the, uh, of, uh, of the passenger trains on the Liverpool and Manchester route. So far, so good. And then in January, 25th of January, 1831, I said it was accident prone. The rocket had another accident, quite a serious one again, because in the, in the um, Olive Mount cutting, some work was being undertaken on the track and the workman had not reset the points correctly in front of a passenger train. And there was a serious derailment. Rocket went through the points and was turned over onto its side. The wheels we know were broken and there was quite a lot of repairs that needed to be carried out. And so once again, they picked up the pieces, they took it back to Edge Hill and they started work to not only improve, uh, sorry, not only to repair all the damage, but to make further improvements as well. Let's have a look at the frame and side view. Well, it looks a bit bent there, but we'll come back to the bending in a minute. What is new is the brace from the leading buffer beam back to the uh, horn of the driving axle. That brace, that diagonal brace, was added at that time. Uh, so instead of just being a straightforward, uh, longitudinal um, uh, uh, wrought iron frame, they put it on the brace to, to, to stiffen it up. And that's what it looks like uh, at first hand. See the bottom there of the brace, uh, and it's fitted to the bottom of the horn and bolted through. That is a, a, a stiffening number. The driving wheels had to be replaced. They were clearly badly damaged. They're, they're wooden driving wheels, um, and they needed to be replaced. Now, what was interesting is that 
when the, the first axle that was used on, on a rocket was only three and a quarter inch diameter. But the axle that it now carries is four inches in diameter. And this was the occasion where it, the replacement was made. So you've got a, a brand new pair of wheels, pair, pair of driving wheels, uh, and uh, fitted to a, a brand new axle. So it's quite a lot of damage that needed to be uh, replaced. On the left-hand side, after all these years, there's still some no, marks, marks of damage. Some of the parts are, um, uh, are slightly burnt. Some of the fellows are, are burnt, but also there are splits. You can just make out in that um, spoke in the center of the picture there, uh, the, the split, which uh, you know, survives to this day, obviously. So from all our investigations, John was able to produce this uh, splendid drawing uh, of the driving wheels. Um, nothing special about the driving wheel because a, a good wheelwright uh, would have been able to have managed this quite uh, competently. Uh, the whole assembly was uh, then fitted with uh, a wrought iron rim and fixed to the, uh, to, to the uh, uh, outside of the wheel. And on top of all that, uh, a tire was then shrunk onto the wheel uh, as well. Um, you can see there that um, the, 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 uh, uh, the horse collar, as we call it, uh, which fitted not only over the axle, but also over the, uh, the um, crank bin, uh, is quite uh, noticeable there. And also the, the um, fitting of the axle to the, sorry, the fitting of the wheel to the axle was undertaken with four separate keys around the perimeter. Right, now come to the cylinders. Because famously, rocket cylinders were dropped from the original 38 degrees to the horizontal down to eight degrees to the horizontal. To do that, uh, and I, I should also say that the cylinders were reversed upside down, inverted is the word, so that this, the steam chest is on the top rather than on the bottom. And the only way you could undertake that, of course, is by swapping the left-hand uh, cylinder for the, to the right and the right-hand cylinder to the, uh, to the left. This was all came about because of the uh, motion uh, of the locomotive, uh, which because of the um, improvements in the track and improvements in speed, the locomotive was started to um, be a little dangerous going along the track uh, with the uh, undue um, dynamic forces uh, on the loco between the loco and the track itself. Now to enable that to happen, the original brackets for the cylinders were removed and new brackets were put on. You can just see the brackets there uh, on the side of the boiler, completely new fittings these, uh, and it went to the back of the new uh, wrought iron firebox back. And stiffeners were put on along the outside of the, the firebox uh, back uh, to stiffen the whole assembly, which is the reason why this, the firebox preceded the, the stiffening because of the two different occasions that the work was undertaken. Another view uh, of the firebox is there. And you can see there the, the, the stiffener right at the bottom underneath the firehole door. Also, of course, by lowering the cylinders uh, and inverting them, you needed new steam lines from the regulator valve, which is uh, on the back plate at the top there. Uh, so new steam pipes were put in, copper steam pipes uh, were put in at that time uh, to the to the steam chest. The actual regulator was conical in shape, uh, fitting into this uh, housing. On the bottom right image there, you've got on the right hand side, uh, the um, flange for fitting to the back plate of the firebox. And on the both sides, you've got the flanges for the two steam pipes 
to take the seam down to the uh, uh, seam chests. And inside the housing, you had the fitting for the conical uh, regulator. Now, I did discuss this with the um, uh, in Invicta uh, study last year, because, and in fact, I used uh, these images at that time uh, because they are in fact identical. And so we learned a lot about Invicta uh, just by, by having examined uh, rockets in this uh, sort of detail. Right, now the smoke box. Well, this is probably the one that uh, was fitted at that time, was probably the third form of smoke box. Smoke boxes are easy in the early commerce uh, to replace. But after all the damage that was uh, occasioned by these accidents, uh, almost certainly they were replacements. This firebox, this uh, smoke box, uh, in, in fact, belongs even to a later period still. Um, the right hand image is one that uh, I was able to take when I was inside the uh, smoke box looking up the, uh, the, 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 the chimney. Now we come to the valve gear. You know, the story gets really exciting now. Right, the valve gear. It was replaced after the olive mount accident. The same sort of design, exactly the same design, but because of the wider axle, four inch axle instead of the narrow axle before, they had to replace the components. But what we did have to, uh, were, were able to do was to compare that fitted to Invicta with that now fitted to Rocket. And it was quite clear that uh, the one fitted to Invicta is, of course, older than that fitted to Rocket, which is quite a useful uh, clue because uh, of that sort of prog progression. We were able to understand what they learned about operating using this uh, slip eccentric uh, system. Now, slip eccentric. You can see there on the top left the cluster of uh, the two eccentrics, one for forward motion and one for reverse motion. Uh, you can see leading from it the eccentric straps and eccentric rods, taking the motion forward to the uh, uh, to, to the um, uh, rocking shaft that serves the movement of the valves themselves. The motion was obtained by the axle turning, and therefore it needed a very firm fitting onto the axle of a dog. Now the dog in this case is the component which actually drives the eccentric cluster. If that dog was clamped on very, very hard indeed. One dog for forward motion and one dog for backward motion. To move the cluster from side to side required the use of a yoke between them. This yoke would then move the whole assembly across with a, about two and a quarter inch movement side to side, actually movement. That was achieved by the foot pedal. And there's the, the foot pedal on the bottom there showing that the motion of that was taken all the way through to the front end, was that then the lever managed to move that uh, uh, yoke and hence move the assembly uh, across between forward and rear motion. But of course, one in, the, the dog engaged in one part of the eccentric would not automatically engage with the reverse uh, movement you had to rotate the axle by, I think it's uh, was it, uh, 140 degrees or something. Um, and by so doing, you therefore led the driver to try and undertake the movement between the two, not manually so much, it, it, it would move if you manually operated the valve lever until it, the uh, reverse dog was engaged. But what the drivers learned all too quickly is that if you re removed the cluster from the forward motion, 
whilst the train was still running, you could then engage the reverse uh, before it actually came to a halt. Now, the drivers are very quick at doing this, like anything to save themselves work. And I must say, when we built the uh, replica planet uh, at Manchester, that was one of the first things uh, that I and my colleagues learned to undertake was the, the uh, reversing move, move whilst you were uh, uh, underway. That's a difficult thing to describe without pointing at it. <laughs> right. Let's have a closer look. There is the cluster in the, in the center, and you can see between the two, uh, the, 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 the two eccentrics themselves is the yoke attached to that bottom bar at the bottom there. That was the, the means by which it was moved axially. You can see there at the bottom of the left-hand one is the dog itself. You can see the clamps, you see the dog itself at the bottom. You can see also the slot into which the dog engaged to drive uh, the eccentric round. Uh, in this view, it is the reverse dog which is engaged. There's John's isometric view uh, of the assembly. You can see there perhaps a, a bit better, uh, the dog assembly there uh, and, the, and the slots. So we dismantled the whole thing to understand fully all that was going on. So there, uh, top left, you can see the slot into which the dog engaged for the forward direction. Uh, and also, of course, the, uh, on the, the nearer view, you can see the reverse dog, uh, which has been engaged in that uh, view. And at the bottom, having dismantled everything other than the dog, you can see it quite clearly uh, as it's been um, clamped to, to the axle. Right, so much for the for that. Now we come to yet another bad accident that rockets took part in. This was in uh, 1834, I think it was. No, 1833, anyway. Uh, on the Wigan Branch Railway, which branched off from the Liverpool and Manchester at Parkside. And it came into collision with a coal train Nobody was hurt, fortunately, but, and I quote, engine and tender much damaged. The repair cost £74.14 shillings and sevenpence. That we do know. But exactly what they did for the repair, uh, we don't, but we can start to piece it all together. So there was a further opportunity to improve some of the components of, uh, of rockets, again, to sort of catch up. Uh, with the progress of the other locomotives. So let's have a look at the cylinders. The opportunity was taken for it being in the shops to re-bore the cylinders. They were originally eight inch diameter uh, the, um, and 16 and a half inch stroke. By the time they finished, they bored it out to eight and a quarter inches in diameter uh, with a stroke of then 17 inches. So just, uh, tweaking uh, the uh, cylinder dimensions by that rebore. We were able to take one of the steam chests apart. You can see there on the right, uh, the steam chest removed, and you can see there the, um, the, the, the opening, the valve openings. The one at the top is for the steam to pass to the leading end of the cylinder, the one at the bottom to the trailing end, and the one in the middle is, of course, for the exhaust uh, steam. So we were able to have a good understanding uh, of the form in which the casting was made uh, for the uh, for the for the valve chest. We also took apart the one of the pistons, we able to remove that from the cylinder uh, and dismantle it. Now the original uh, rings were made of hemp, but either at this uh, in fact, almost certainly on this occasion of rebuilding, uh, the brass rings were put onto the locomotive uh, and kept in place with steel springs. So this was quite an innovation, an important innovation, uh, to uh, reduce the loss of uh, steam that, that had been occasioned on uh, uh, hitherto. There's John's 
drawing of the uh, form of the piston. Now, this is what the drawing which was prepared in 1834, this is what it looked like. So you're incorporating there all of the changes that I've just been running through and putting them all together. We, we know we've got that as a target. That's what it looked like, including the, the uh, smoke box, which I, I mentioned on Plasson. From that time, however, in spite of all these rebuildings, the locomotive was just used as a standby locomotive because the improvements that were made to the fleet of locomotives on the line was such that rocket was just, it just wasn't economic to rebuild it any anymore. And so they put it aside at Edge Hill uh, as uh, and used it just on, as a standby loco uh, for use as and when required. Then an extraordinary thing happened because one Lord Dundonald, who was a admiral uh, who had a distinguished naval record, but saw himself as an amateur inventor. And he had this thing about rotary engines. He argued that reciprocating engines were less, far less efficient than a rotary engine would be. And so he approached the Liverpool and Manchester Railway and asked for a locomotive with a straight axle, one of them was without a cranked axle, uh, if one could be made available so that he could try out at his expense the fitting of a rotary uh, engine. And this is the, the only image that we've come across uh, to illustrate uh, the form of rotary engine that he, um, that, that he suggested. Now, he had spent very nearly 80 pounds on these changes. That's a lot of money. So therefore, Rocket went through 80 pounds worth of alterations, which John and I sought to try and understand uh, how the steam was fed through to these, uh, 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 to, to these rotary engines. Um, it was a failure. All that money was wasted. He did subsequently try, he tried again on the London and Greenwich Railway as well, but it was no more successful. Um, George Stevenson himself was always dead against rotary engines. He even published a paper in 1848, just before he died, uh, on the misunderstandings about rotary engines. They would never work. So at this time, they didn't. But we looked for clues. And just one clue has survived. This is a view inside the smoke box, looking at the outside of the front tube plate. Around the perimeter, you can see the fitting of the surviving smoke box. But in between, there is a flange plate in the center of the picture. That was for a pipe which used to pass through the front end of the smoke box, of the um, uh, front tube plate. Now, what on earth was that for, was the question. And we came to the conclusion, but we just cannot confirm it, that this was the exit for the steam pipe that was used to direct the steam towards a Dundonald's rotary engines. And when they were removed, and before the engine was sold on, they simply blanked off that hole, plated it over, as you can see, with an awful lot of guns. Look at the thickness of the guns there um, to, uh, to make it uh, steam tight. So that was quite a, an interesting uh, uh, thing to, 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 uh, to dwell on, because hitherto we've never really understood how Dundonald's engine was, uh, was, was tried. It was simply removed, and the axle returned just to, a, to this normal straight axle. So uh, after all of this, in 1836, uh, Rocket was put on sale and was acquired secondhand by the Earl of Carlisle in the October of 1836. It went to the Nayworth collieries, uh, operated the coal trains up there, 
Uh, note the buffer beam that was photographed in the that uh, first uh, photograph taken uh, in the uh, 1870s outside in, in, here in Tel or in London. Um, and you can see there the lower buffers, which have been placed underneath and, and fitted with uh, those wrought iron um, uh, brackets. Now these were brought because the wagons used on the colliery system were lower than those than the wagon than the buffer height on the mainline system. Now this is a, a feature of any loco that operated jointly on either industrial uh, and mainline engines. It needed to accommodate those two different buffing heights. Sadly, those additions were removed by the Science Museum, but we'll come back to that. Right, let's have a last look at the frame. It looks bent. It was bent, it is bent, because a number of heavy buffing incidents, I, let's put it be polite, uh, occurred during its time on the colliery system. And each time it bent, uh, that's what happened. Uh, and consequently, it has retained that, uh, that, that um, misalignment uh, to this very day. It ended its service, as I said before, in about 1840, and was then made ready for going to Newcastle to uh, take its part in the Great Exhibition. So this, we think, is the answer to another major problem, and that is, this is a view of the outside of the main driving axle. It has been very badly scored. You can see there the depth of the score, which we came to the conclusion was created by the clamp bolt of one of the driving dogs. They really were clamped hard. So if you tried to move the locomotive without disengaging the uh, eccentrics, then you would turn the clamp bolt into a lathe. And as you dragged it along, then you would create this deep groove. Extraordinary. Just to, to, it was all hidden underneath uh, the, uh, the, the, the eccentric cluster. It was only revealed when we took it apart. And incidentally, you can just see the two um, pot marks at the top there, that they are fitters marks. And we came across an awful lot of fitters marks uh, on all of the components. Some were in uh, L for left and R for right, that, that simple sort of thing, uh, but they're all fitters marks. Uh, and they're all in, in itself uh, takes us back to the men who worked on rocket uh, all those years uh, ago. And now we come back to uh, the photograph that was taken um, in the 1870s. It's the nearest we've got to the locomotive as it was uh, when it was dispatched from Newcastle uh, to, uh, to, to South Kensington. It's a, a good, at, but not a good, it is an attempt by the men at, at uh, the Hall Street factory to try and make it look like a locomotive. Uh, because all you had was the skeletal remains uh, of rockets. It didn't have a chimney. It didn't have exhaust pipes. It didn't have a firebox. It didn't have connecting rods. It was just a skeleton. So, chimney, exhaust pipes, firebox. Oh, yes, yeah, so on the carrying wheel set, it was completely wrong. Um, it, it had been taken from of another uh, wagon. It was a wagon wheel set that had been put on. It was completely erroneous. Um, and so it was left to Ernest Forward of the Science Museum to start to improve the appearance of, uh, of Rocket to make it more appropriate. He put in an awful lot of work uh, to, in, the, in his research into uh, Rocket. And so he replaced the chimney. Uh, he removed the exhaust pipes. Uh, he removed the firebox. Now, this was quite important for us to understand because when we were going over every square inch of the locomotive, 
What do we find on the smoke box, on the firebox crown, but lead rivets? And we said, how is it possible to have a lead rivet on a firebox? Because the answer is that they were put on in 1862 by the Stevenson Company to fit that replica firebox, which was subsequently removed uh, by the Science Museum. That was the explanation for that. In 1892, uh, the, the, the carrying wheel set was so it was recognized as being so wrong that they would uh, they removed that set and actually cast or had cast for them a, a, a brand new wheel set, which is the one which is seen on the locomotive uh, nowadays. So Trying to summarize all this, this is what rain, what, what the rocket looked like at the time of the Rainhill trials. So we've been able to argue the case uh, component by component, which uh, the arguments were accepted uh, by the National Railway Museum. And incidentally, I can uh, hold up that our report was turned into uh, a, a volume. I'll, I'll point it this way for the benefit of the uh, Zoom uh, viewers. Uh, copies are still available, by the way, if uh, anybody is, would, would like to see copies, if they get in touch with myself or John. Um, this was accepted by the National Railway Museum. And so when they came to re-boiler the replica, the working replica of the locomotive, it was re-boilered in exactly the form that we had illustrated in our report. So there you see it in, in its more recent form uh, with no, with no uh, dome on the leading end, but it was in fact a uh, safety valve that uh, was completely encased uh, inside that uh, riser there. There's many more components that we could have discussed, but I thought I would draw a line there and respond to any questions that you may have. Thank you very much indeed.